Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Brooks. I'm Professor of Sociology. And my name is Paul Hodkinson, and I'm Professor of Sociology. And uh, over the last few years, uh, Rachel and I have been doing quite a, quite a lot of research on caregiving fathers, so fathers who are primary or equal carers in their household. And uh, we did an initial phase of interviews a few years ago with fathers when their children were quite young. And we were struck really by the range of caregiving tasks that they were involved in, uh, the extent to which they sort of really, really appeared to have um, uh, embraced the notion of being a sort of caregiving father as part of their identity and as part of their, their horizons looking forward, really. More recently, uh, we decided to go back and interview uh, some of the, um, a lot of the fathers um, a second time, this time when their children uh, were at school, about sort of five years um, after the first interviews. And we wanted really to sort of um, understand how things had developed in their families, whether they were still fulfilling the same sort of le level of caregiving that they were before, what things had changed, uh, any challenges they'd faced and so on. So what did we find in our research? Well, first of all, we found that in general, fathers had continued with their very extensive um, caregiving roles and identities. But we did also notice um, some gender differences, particularly in relation to education-related activity and education-related parenting. Now, previous research has highlighted that this is typically an area that's dominated by mothers, with mothers um, carrying out um, most of the tasks. But in contrast to this existing body of literature, our research illustrated how fathers were heavily involved in education-related parenting. And in the article, um, we argue that fathers could be seen as the educational labourers, taking on quite a lot of the kind of fairly mundane day-to-day -day tasks of educational parenting, such as packing their children's bags ready for school, taking them to school, picking them up, helping them with homework. And during the COVID pandemic, often being the one who was responsible for sitting down with them and doing the homeschooling. But it was really interesting that fathers tended to take much less of a role in relation to aspects to do with forward planning and making key decisions. And, and here we talked about how mothers were typically the ones who took on these tasks. And we talked about them in the article as educational executives. And so here it was much more likely that the mothers rather than fathers were the ones who were carrying out research in relation to what were the best books, toys to encourage their children's development. They were the ones who were researching um, the school choice options and um, guiding fathers towards the best decision to take in relation to those. And also sometimes liaising with schools when difficult issues arise. So it was really interesting that, that despite the fathers doing much of the mundane day-to-day -day work, um, related to education. Mothers retained this responsibility for higher level decision making and planning. So we then turned our attention really to sort of thinking about, okay, well, why might it be that we've got sort of fathers who are in, in general uh, taking a very significant amount of responsibility for caring in their families, and also in terms of everyday tasks and are doing very significant amounts of the kind of education related um, parent work. Um, and I mean, there, are, there are a few sort of things um, to think about here, we think. So, so firstly, there is a broader tendency, and, and lots of literature sort of talks about this, uh, for mothers to sort of um, have pressures on them to take overall responsibility for care. So even in situations where a father is actually doing quite a lot of sort of everyday stuff in terms of caring, um, it's quite often the case that mothers continue to take a very significant amount of that, that sort of moral responsibility and, and also perhaps some of that sort of what we could call sort of executive responsibility for overall direction of travel um, and that, that kind of thing. Um, so, so that's that broader kind of set of sort of gender issues I, I think exist in the background and clearly play some role here. We also, though, in the research, identified some more particular factors that, that seem to be acting as, if you like, sort of barriers to fathers becoming more involved in, in those sort of um, decision-making aspects of the educational parenting. And those really relate to the ways in which both institutions and other parents can position mothers and fathers. And so we found firstly that schools as institutions had a tendency to position fathers 
uh, as the secondary carer and mothers as the primary carer. Um, particularly through everyday things like who they would want to communicate with, who would get the phone call when the, when the school wanted to communicate with one of the parents. And nearly always the fathers told us it was the mother. And, and in some cases you had these sort of odd situations where they, the mother had to then sort of give them the father's details because he was the one that was actually the person that they should be sort of speaking to on that particular day. So schools are, are wanting to sort of speak to mothers and sort of giving across that sort of message that mother is regarded as the primary sort of educational um, parent, if you like. And then we also found that in relation to sort of parent networks, which are really important to sort of parental identities, the way, the way in which parents see themselves and various practical aspects of the way that parenting works, um, that other parents too sort of tended to sort of, perhaps not surprisingly, sort of position the mother as the sort of default um, caregiver and particularly the default person in relation to sort of educational um, matters. So, so fathers sort of talk to us about how they sometimes struggle to sort of really get involved in parent networks, whether that was sort of online WhatsApp groups to, to, that connected with their children's classes at school, or whether it was sort of more face-to-face -face sort of contacting playgrounds. And that then sort of went on to sort of, you know, who, who sort of organised various things to, to do with sort of children's with parent, children with parent networks and so on too. So we think that in addition to those broader pressures on, on, you know, perhaps sort of women to sort of take sort of primary responsibility for, for um, sort of overall direction of, of parenting, there might have been some specific practical factors there to do with the way fathers are positioned by schools and by other parents and, and their sort of position in relation to those things that may, if you like, have made it a little bit easier for them to take a sort of back seat in relation to, to some of those things. So to summarise, I think our follow-up study of these fathers has really illustrated that um, the, the caregiving practices that we observed um, when we first interviewed them have continued over time and that um, these kind of counter-normative care arrangements have been enduring um, for, for a fairly long period in the families that, that we spoke to. But our research also highlights, I think, um, some of the limitations and the barriers to um, extensive father involvement, and that these can endure too as children get older.